Good morning. We have here Mr. Buckley, uh, headmaster of Richmond House School. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to speak to you. Hi. Well, you have arrived at Richmond House School during one of the most uh, difficult years the world has experienced. Now, did you expect uh, such amazing res uh, results from school? I think it, it, the difficulty for me is to understand what you mean by the amazing results. Because actually, if I look at across the whole of the business and I look at the stakeholders within the school, um, the, the major influx for us is for the parents. You know, how do the parents view what we do? And if the um, information from them is that, you know, we're doing a good job and they're pleased with the service that we're providing, then actually, yes, that's a success. If it's by um, number of issues that are raised through the pandemic and then dealt with appropriately and successfully, then yes, we've been a success. And then if I look at the children, have we managed to deal with the children's gaps in their learning? Um, have we raised the attainment in actual fact? Rather than just putting up with um, intervention work, have we raised the barrier for the children? And then I'd say yes, because actually our staff have used their professional judgment in looking at those gaps. We've used data to help us to plug those gaps. Uh, and actually, in the first lockdown, we had a 98% attendance rate. The, the worst thing for us was the second lockdown. We were completely ready to go on the Sunday before the Monday. We had a, an inset day on the Monday. And on the Sunday, I listened to the Prime Minister speaking to Andrew Marr, rubbed my hands, how wonderful that we're going back to school on Monday. Great. And then on Monday, through our inset day, the traction from the media brought it up to the point where at nine o'clock at night when the uh, PM said, no, we're on a second lockdown, we had an immediate staff meeting, an emergency staff meeting, and then overnight we switched the way that we worked from being uh, having remote learning that was paper-based straight to online learning. Now, we prepared for that up to that point, but the response from parents was absolutely phenomenal. And then come to lockdown three, of course, we're, we've gone through this, not a single bubble burst, 100% attendance. So if that's a measure of our success, then yes, we've been successful. But that, that's, not, that's not me. That's a collective responsibility. That, that's the whole team from right down to our cleaners who are going and wiping down surfaces every hour or fogging rooms to make sure that the uh, COVID-19 uh, bug can't be transmitted or transferred has been really impressive for us and that, and that for me is because we've had precise procedures in place and they've been carried out really effectively by everybody that's there so you know yes I think in, in those terms we've been successful but I'd go back to where our parents are because there are um, there are core users and you know what we've seen from them is they've given us a lot of trust they've trusted us with the children's learning they've trusted to, us to upskill the children uh, they've trusted us that we put our rigorous procedures in place and that they would work. And they've trusted us by giving us fantastic testimony, testimonials that we can then share with other people. So, uh, and we know that through the forums and surveys that we've run with them over that time. So in regard to the answer there, I'd say I would hope that we've been successful. Certainly the things that come across my desk tell me that we are, but we're always open to listen to improve. Fantastic. And how do how does Richmond House School differentiate itself from other independent schools? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think all independent schools have, a, have the same raison d'etre. Uh, they will all offer uh, the warm, caring environment that they say uh, they do on their websites. And, and, and I have no doubt that every one of them do that. And, and we are in that lovely throng of independent schools that can say that. Uh, I think the difference in our school is how we do that. So we have a product that's a holistic product. We believe in a broad and balanced curriculum for the children. And what we really want to do is to expose them to loads of different opportunities to find their way through life. And, uh, and we'll find a bit where they'll be fantastic. We might find a really good creative writer that comes on, goes on to be an author or a journalist, or, or we'll find a sportsman or a musician. Um, but what we'll also do is we'll educate that child so that whilst they might be a brilliant sportsman, they're also an educated uh, spectator in other areas, in art or in music or in, in, in the written word. So, you know, it's the how bit that's, that's really important to me. And, and this idea that we're a caring, 
uh, school means that we've got detailed knowledge of every child. And that, to me, is really important. We've got small class sizes, no more than 18 in the class, two form entry, which means you've got 36. And that's really effective because on, an, on a, a lesson by lesson basis, you can speak to every single child and give them f verbal feedback on the work that they're doing within that lesson on that day. And those interactions build up and they create traction and the trust that you get between the member staff and the child then allows the child to take on the feedback and then implement the feedback to improve the work thereafter. So, you know, that detailed knowledge of the child is crucial, I think, and that's where we get there. But it's also about the parental involvement too. We've got very close connections with our parents um, in that what we do is if we spot a problem, we can intervene really quickly. Or if we see something that's fantastic, it's a postcard home that we send to say, do you realise? Or a text message home to say, this happened today. And when, when you sit in a board meeting and your phone rings and you glance at it and it shows a picture of your child doing something fantastic, there is no better feeling as a parent. And I think that level of trust that we've developed over time is perhaps one of our USPs. And of course, we've got these fantastic grounds that we use, haven't we? We've got all that wide space. And from the front, when you look from the front side, you wouldn't believe the space that we've got behind. And so we utilise that very carefully to ensure that actually we get our children out. We look after our children's uh, well-being and their health and, and use health and exercise uh, to develop that. So this idea that, you know, we've got all this space, we've got this detailed look at the child, I... I'm really involved with the children at the lowest level. I don't, I'm not the haughty kind of person who sits and then pontificates around. I, I use the Pomodoro technique. I don't know if you've come across, well, as an Italian, you must have come across that. Well, only on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, with me, what I do is I, I look at each child and I'll spend 20 minutes on that child, just focusing on the data that we've got on them, what we know about them as people, uh, what we know about their family and how they're doing so that we can really get to the crux of how they're doing. And, and, and because we're not a through school, we stop at the age of 11. What that means is, is we can give the parents time to consider what the skill set of their children is. And then with our connections out into the uh, wider world and, and the, the secondary sector, whether it be independent or state, whichever the parents choose, we can advise really carefully on uh, what would be the best school for the parent and the child to make sure that they're um, getting the best out of the children. And that's what it's all about. It's about maximising and realising the potential of every single child who comes through your door. And, and for me, I say this a lot, so I, I'll repeat it here, but any parent who sees this video will, will testify that they've heard me say this. If you're going to entrust your child into my care, I want your child treating as I would expect my child to be treated. And that's with really high standards. I want them to be taught properly. I want them to behave impeccably. I want them to uh, enjoy their learning. And I don't want them to be castigated for getting things wrong. For me, and we say this to the children all the time, it's the process, not the destination. So enjoy that journey and go back and check on the process. Make sure you've got it right. And then when the destination comes along and it's really successful, yeah, enjoy that. Or if it's not, go back and find out why not. And then, and then we start to build the individuals. We've got a lovely location. We've got lovely children, lovely parents that we work with. And do you know what? The children here, much as I am, they come into work, they skip into work, and they're really happy to learn. And that, for me, is probably the most important thing. Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. My kids, both of my children, are extremely happy to go to Richmond High School. Oh, oh please hear that. Um, so here comes an interesting one. How do you see the school system in the United Kingdom evolving in the next few years? Oh, well, wow, that's interesting. Um, I think you have to look at the context of uh, the UK education system and the, um, the changes that have gone on through time. And I think we are in a time of flux. I think the pandemic has brought that to the fore. But previously there were, it was a two-tier system and you had a secondary modern system which was based around vocational work and uh, a grammar system which was acad academically elitist. And then in the late 70s, they joined them together to be a comprehensive system. And it was a mixed ability setting 
not arranged by uh, academic ability. And what's happened now is that the tertiary system hasn't really caught up to this new system and it's still flowing through. And so the idea in years gone by that 10 percent, the top 10 percent of the academic age uh, ability range would go to university has now shifted. And actually, there are lots of children that go through university. And what we'll find is that children now will, or the young adults now, will end up doing two degrees. In the late 80s, uh, early 90s, I lived and worked in the southeast, very close to the central uh, headquarters in the UK of Ford Motor Company. And a lot of the parents at the school that I was at then went to, uh, worked at the Ford Motor Company and sent their children to us. And we, to, a, to a person, every single parent who got their primary degree were then being asked to do a secondary degree. And they were all asked to do an MBA. And that's great, you know, uh, uh, but actually we're now going to get to a point where people will do a primary degree and then they'll do a secondary degree, and I've no doubt in the future there'll be a third degree that they may have to do, uh, or a, 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 an addition to that. And so ultimately for me, I think that our system has to look at how it's useful to society. And the academic element is one element of it, but it's only a small element. And actually, the needs of society are much bigger and because of that, I think our school has to, or schools in general, have to involve themselves with industry much more closely. And I believe that industry should come back into the classroom. And actually, there should be that two-way process where industry saying, this is what we need. Uh, and we say, right, we'll try and develop that. In the early years, we develop the children and we develop their curriculum on a weekly basis. Virtually, they plan based on what the children's learning needs are. And I can see that happening in the future, where actually, when we're teaching, we teach skills more than we teach facts. And the skills are the important thing, because they can be transferable. I read a, re a recent article, uh, and I, ca I can't remember where it was, but it said that the youth of today can expect to have 10 different jobs. Okay. And if that's the case then, they're gonna transfer their skills. There'll be some core skills that they'll use, you know, just talking to people and getting on with people is really important. But this idea that they can transfer skills across 10 different sectors is going to be really important. And so I think that, for me, will reign. And that should then come back into the school system. And of course, what that means is, if you have everybody educated at the same level, with an MBA, for example, everybody thinks the same. And the problem with that is that you get no ingenuity then. You get no innovation. And actually what I think we're doing here at Richmond House is we've got that in our mind's eye. And what we really want is a high level of performance from the children with the ingenuity that pops out of the norm that gives you the individuality that creates innovation in the workplace. And we've got to start that really early. We've got to start that here. And because of that, independence that we have that allows us the opportunity to train children in the ways of thinking that their skills are transferable, that actually what you were taught in here, we can use that there, we can use that then, and how does it all link together? So I think that individuality, the individual thought processes that we develop here, uh, the confident, articulate, uh, self-reflective children that we have uh, creates an all-round team player with just that spark of brilliance that might just make some industries look and think yeah, that's the kind of person I want in my sector. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Brookley. It's been a, a great chat. And uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, go on the Richmond House School website for more information. Indeed. Lovely speaking to you. All the very best to everybody. Bye for now.